Good evening. My name is Catherine Bergman, and I am the president of St. Jerome's University at the University of Waterloo. The University of Waterloo Board of Governors established the Pascal Lectures in 1978. Since that time, the series has brought many outstanding academics to this university, including this evening speaker, Professor John Lennox. Blaise Pascal lived from 1632 to 1662. He was a 17th century French academic and Christian. He is remembered today as a forerunner of Newton in the establishment of calculus and as the author of the Christian meditation, Les Pensées. Members of the University of Waterloo wishing to establish a forum for the presentation of Christian issues in an academic environment have chosen to commemorate the spirit of Pascal with this annual event, the Pascal Lectures on Christianity and the University. The Pascal Lectures bring to the University of Waterloo outstanding individuals with an international reputation who have distinguished themselves in an area of scholarly endeavor and an area of Christian thought or life. These individuals engage in dialogue with the university community on some aspect of our community, our theories, our research, our leadership role in society. They challenge the university to a search for truth through personal faith and intellectual inquiry, finding the intersection of faith and reason. This evening marks the beginning of the Pascal Lectures on Christianity and the University for the 2014-2015 academic year. At this time, I would like to invite Professor John North to formally introduce our guest speaker this evening, Professor John Lennox. Good evening. My name is John North, and uh, as Catherine has said, I'm in the Department of English. This evening, we're pleased to have with us Professor John Lennox. John was born in Northern Ireland and brought up in Armagh, where his father ran a store. He attended the Royal School in Armagh and went on to become exhibitioner and senior scholar at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, where in 1962 he also attended the last lectures of C.S. Lewis on the poet John Donne. <coughs> Lennox obtained an MA and a PhD degree at the University of Cambridge. He was awarded a Doctor of Science degree in mathematics by the University of Cardiff for his research. Lennox, uh, furthermore, holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford and an MA degree in bioethics at the University of Surrey. Upon completing his doctorate, Lennox moved to Cardiff, Wales, becoming a reader in mathematics at the University of Wales. During the 29 years in Cardiff, he spent a year at each of the universities of Würzburg, Freiburg, as an Alexander Humboldt fellow, von Humboldt fellow, and Vienna. And he's lectured extensively in both Eastern and Western Europe, also Russia and North America, on mathematics, apologetics, and the exposition of scripture. John has published in over 70 peer-reviewed articles on mathematics and has co-authored two Oxford mathematic mono mathematical monographs and has worked as a translator for Russian mathematics. He also teaches science and religion at the University of Oxford and is the author of a number of books on the relations of science, religion, and ethics, the most recent of which are Informa or Informatica 2001, has Science Buried God, 2002, Worldview, 2004, 
One of his recent books has uh, something of a link with the University of Waterloo. It is God and Stephen Hawking. Whose design is it anyway? <laughs> he has spoken in many different countries, in conferences, and as an academic fellow, including various trips to the Soviet Union. By the way, his books are available outside uh, in the foyer uh, and also in our bookstore. You'll notice that uh, towards the end of the lectures of the lecture, uh, there will be a phone number flashed on the screen behind me. Uh, that phone number <coughs> is uh, for you to submit a question. Make your questions short. Uh, they'll come down here to uh, be received and then, uh, and then handed to John. So now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor John Lennox. Madam President, Professor North, ladies and gentlemen, what brilliant foresight you've had in inviting an Irishman to address you on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and I'm impressed that your spirit of grace in forsaking parades and all else and coming to this evening lecture. I have been at this university before in its mathematics department, which has had many distinguished figures in my own field of algebra and group theory. But I'm not going to talk about that tonight because I've been honored by this university in being asked to give the Pascal lectures. And that is a very wonderful thing to be able to do. Because Blaise Pascal and his book Les Pensées was one of my childhood introductions to the wonderful French language. It was, I think, the first book I read in French. And so it is specially dear to me, and it was lovely to read it again in recent days. Pascal was a physicist, a mathematician, as well as a philosopher and theologian, a child prodigy homeschooled by his father, after his mother died at the age of three. By the age of 10, he'd invented a calculating machine, which was of enormous help to his dad, who was a tax official. And when he was 16, he wrote a paper on conic sections, which was acclaimed by his fellow mathematicians as the most powerful and valuable contribution that had been made to mathematical science since the days of Archimedes. This paper laid the foundations for the modern treatment of conic sections. He made contributions to science, worked on the barometer, invented the syringe and the hydraulic lift, and made major contributions to mathematics, influencing, for instance, the development of modern probability theory. He was also an active philanthropist. So he was a towering genius. And though uh, raised in the heyday of Enlightenment thinking, he found reason inadequate. It could not, in his opinion, access everything unaided. Reason's last step, he wrote, is the recognition that there are an infinite number of things that are beyond it. And he concluded in his famous statement, the heart has its reasons which reason does not know at all. A statement that soon became a chief critique of rationalism and the starting point for a defense of the Christian faith that still influences people today. There was a decisive experience in his life on the night of Monday the 23rd of November 1654 when he was 32. He had an experience of God that determined the course of his few remaining years. And he recorded it on a piece of paper that he had sewn into the lining of his doublet, and it was discovered after his death. He'd carried it with him at all times. And he writes, The year of grace, 1654, Monday the 23rd of November, Feast of St. Clement, 
Pope and martyr, and of others in the martyrology, Eve of St. Chrysogenus, martyr, and others. From about half past ten in the evening until half past midnight, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. Certainty, certainty, heartfelt joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. And under the influence, the influence of this experience, Pascal decided to write an apologia, a defense for the Christian religion, directed in his day at the sophisticated freethinkers, our libertins, who preferred polite agnosticism to militant atheism. Sadly, he died at the age of 40. And the fragments he had published were collected together and became Les Pensées. They're still in print and in great demand. Now, Pascal was a boy of 10 when Galileo was condemned by the church in 1633. He wasn't completely convinced by Galileo's argument, but had the humility and wisdom to point out in one of his letters that faith is so far from destroying the certainty of the senses that it would, on the contrary, destroy faith to cast doubt on the faithful evidence of the sentence, senses. No one, not even the Pope himself, could make decrees that run counter to ascertained facts. Hence the futility of the condemnation of Galileo for the motion of the earth as a scientific theory that might one day be confirmed, wrote Pascal. It was in vain, he said that you obtained from Rome the decree against Galileo, which condemned his opinion regarding the movement of the earth. It will take more than that to prove that it keeps still. And if there were consistent observations proving that it is the earth that goes round, all the men in the world put together couldn't stop it turning, or themselves turning with it. He was sensitive to the danger of hubris in the natural sciences. There is grass on the earth, he wrote. We can see it. From the moon, it cannot be seen. And on this grass, there are hairs, and in these hairs, little creatures. And beyond that, nothing. Presumptuous man. Now, Newton was born in 1643 when Pascal was 20. And so Pascal died before Newton's star ascended. But he anticipated Newton in ways that we have already heard. And a great deal has happened since then. From that sense of integration between science and Christianity that characterized Pascal and also characterized Newton, we have shifted a great deal. So that the recent incumbent of Isaac Newton's chair in Cambridge, Stephen Hawking, has decided that we've got to choose now between science and God. And what I wish to do tonight is to use this as a kind of focus to ask ourselves why and how that shift has taken place. How is it Isaac Newton believed in God and Stephen Hawking does not? What's behind that? Now, of course, there is a widespread notion in our society that science, on the one hand, and God do not mix. I think that is self-evidently false. For a very simple reason. If you take the Nobel Prize for Physics, for instance, it was won a year or two ago by a Scotsman, Peter Higgs, who is an atheist. A few years before that, it was won by an American, Bill Phillips, who's a Christian. Now, it's pretty obvious that they're not divided by their science. They both won the Nobel Prize in Physics. They're divided by their worldview. One is a Christian theist, the other an atheist. And it's important, ladies and gentlemen, to see that the notion that science and God don't mix is a myth. What don't mix is the two worldviews of atheism and theism, or naturalism and theism. And I'm going to suggest to you that the real conflict is a much deeper one. It is a worldview conflict 
and you'll find distinguished scientists on both sides of it. So the real question to ask is, what, where does science sit? Does it, as so many of my colleagues think, point directly towards atheism? Or is it neutral? Or does it point towards theism? This is a very ancient conflict. It goes back probably beyond the ancient Greeks, but they will do. We had the atomists like Democritus and Leucippus with their genius insight that ultimate reality, as they were concerned, was consisted of atoms and empty space. And so, believing that was ultimate reality, they developed a theory of explanation that was bottom-up. Everything can be explained in terms of atoms and empty space. And they became the fathers of materialism. At the same time, there were people like my intellectual hero, Socrates, and uh, Plato, who be taught, and Aristotle, and they believed that there was transcendence, that there was something more. And so barreling up through the centuries into the 21st century academy, we have those two major diametrically opposed worldviews. The worldview of materialism or naturalism, there's a slight distinction between them that even the Oxford Dictionary for Philosophy can't cope with. And then on the other side, there is theism. And as I say, there are scientists on both sides. So how shall we proceed? Well, of course, I'm a pure mathematician. And what I'm going to do tonight is discuss evidence, not proof. Because proof is an ambiguous term, it is multivalent, it has at least two meanings. One is the rigorous pure mathematical meaning, a proof based on axioms with an agreed system of logic leading to a conclusion. You don't get that kind of proof in any of the natural sciences or in ordinary life. You only get it in pure mathematics. But then there's proof in the sense of beyond reasonable doubt, evidence, pointers, indicators. And that doesn't mean, of course, that it is weak. I cannot prove to you that my wife, to whom I've been married for 46 years, I can't prove mathematically that she loves me. But I'd stake my life on it, because I think there's the evidence base for it. In other words, my trust in her is evidence base. So let's think of the pointers. Where will they come from? Well, they come from many sources. And the first one, of course, and the important one, is the history of science itself. Because I find that many contemporary people do not quite realize that modern science is the gift of Christianity to the world. C.S. Lewis formulated Merton's and Whitehead's theses as they've come to be known in the following way. Men became scientific because they expected law and nature, and they expected law and nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And it was Alfred North Whitehead who made the point that Europe in 1500 knew less than Archimedes, who died in 212 BC. And yet by 1700, Newton's Principia Mathematica had been written. And analyzing the reason, he came to the conclusion it must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God, conceived as with the personal energy of Jehovah and the rationality of a Greek philosopher, the impress of the European mind arising from the unquestioned faith of centuries. So to put it quite bluntly, I'm not remotely ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. And it's easy to forget that, that for those early pioneers like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Pascal himself, and up to James Clark Maxwell and even later, Far from their faith in God hindering their science, it was the motor that drove it. As Kepler put it, they were thinking God's thoughts after him. Or as Galileo said, they were studying the universe in the language of mathematics that had been given to them by God. So how is it possible then that we shifted from Newton with his faith in God to Hawking with his saying, you've got to choose between God and science. And I think there are several simple reasons. The first one may surprise you. The first one, and all the rest of them, actually have to do with the nature of explanation. But 
Before I delve into what has become, I think, an intellectual fog, I should perhaps deal with one very common objection that is reflected in the title of Richard Dawkins' famous book, The God Delusion. You're all aware of that book. It has reached Canada, has it? <laughs> yes, well, there we are. Well, The God Delusion, that is, of course, a psychiatric term. And Dawkins defines it as a persistent false belief held in the face of strong countervailing evidence. And he thinks Christianity is that. I'm going to argue that atheism, under Dawkins' definition, is a delusion. It's a persistent false belief held in the face of strong countervailing evidence. But talking about delusion, of course, uh, the first kind of argument is the sort of Freudian argument, isn't it? And often that's where things stop because people just say, well, you know, God is a wish for fulfillment, a projection of your desire to have some pie in the sky when you die and a cuddly father figure, and you can't cope with reality, and so you invent a God to deal with it. And if you come from Ireland, it's worse still, because you probably have been nurtured from the very beginning. That was a challenge to me at Cambridge, ladies and gentlemen. And it changed my life, actually. I'll tell you one or two personal things because they'll help you understand where I'm coming from in this debate. But a student challenged me in my first week and asked me, do you believe in God? And then he suddenly said, oh, I shouldn't have asked you that. You're Irish. <laughs> uh, and all you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> well, of course, I'd heard that before, but it caused me to think. And it changed the compass bearing in my life so that from that day on, I decided to interact as deeply as possible with people who did not share my worldview. I learned German. I spent a lot of time traveling in East Germany during the Cold War. And when the wall fell and I helped to knock it down, I then started going to Russia and interacting with people who'd been subjected to cultural atheism for 75 years. It's been a fascinating journey, I can assure you. But I'm telling you that because of my reaction to the criticism, your God is a delusion. But of course, in those days, I hadn't really read much Freud, and I hadn't realized how his argument boomerangs completely. Let me illustrate it by a little personal uh, note. Stephen Hawking was asked what he thought of religion, and he came out with a wonderful one-liner. Religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. So I was asked what I thought of that. Well, I said, of course, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> now, actually, if you'd been thinking logically, you wouldn't have clapped at all. Because neither of those statements proves anything. Manfred Lutz is Germany's leading psychiatrist. I was speaking with him at a conference in Hamburg just a week ago, and he's written a brilliant book called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten, a brief history of the great one. I hope it comes into English because it is wonderfully witty. But what he says in it, he says, of course, you see, if there is no God, the Freudian argument explaining that religion is a wish fulfillment is brilliant, if there is no God. But, of course, if there is a God, the very same argument shows you how atheism is a wish fulfillment. The projection of the desire never to have to be held responsible for the mess we've made of our lives and others. As Czesław Miłosz, the Polish Nobel laureate for literature, put it, atheism is a great opium of the people. You see, it works both ways, you see. And then Manfred Lutz gives the bottom obvious line. He said, as to whether there is a God or not, which is a substantive question, neither Freud, Jung, or Frankel can help you at all. You've got to look elsewhere. So let's take that out of the fog and go to the first really substantive thing. Why does Hawking ask me to choose between God and science? The first reason, I think, is because of confusion about the nature of God. It took me a long time to twig this, because, of course, I'm old, as you see. I'm over 70, believe it or not. <laughs> so that means that when I was younger and gave lectures mentioning the word God, I could usually assume that people understood what I meant. I meant the triune God of Christianity, 
who created and sustains the heavens and the earth. But of course, that is not true of many of my colleagues, even in Oxford. Because the God of the Bible has been demoted successively until he's one of the pantheon of Greek gods. And you've probably come across the argument that I was faced, well, I've been faced with it many times, of course, because people repeat these things, they get them from Dawkins, and then they jump like memes. Have you heard like memes? They <laughs> go like memes, and uh, in, uh, I did the God debate in Oxford with several philosophers, and Michael Shermer, who's the head of Skeptics magazine in the United States. And so he looked at me and he said, you are an atheist, me with regard to, and he started with Armit, Artemis, Baal, and he went through a very boring list of Greek gods, ending with Zeus. You're an atheist with regard to all of those. And then he delivered the punchline and said, and we just go one god further, and we dismiss the god of the Bible. And I thought, what spectacular intellectual ignorance. <laughs> he obviously knows nothing about the ancient gods of the ancient Near East. But having been interested in them all my life and recently written a book about them, I see that he doesn't quite understand the difference. Because the unilateral opinion about the gods of the ancient Near East, whether they're Assyrian, Babylonian, Egyptian, Roman, or Greek, is that they were descended from the heavens and earth. These mythologies had theogenies as well as cosmogenies, the origin of the gods. And the gods had material origin. And uh, it's Werner Jaeger at Oxford who's written a definitive book on the topic. And he says, the vast difference is this. The gods of the ancients are descended from the heavens of the earth. The god of the Bible created the heavens of the earth. You don't put them in the same category. But the other thing, which is even more important than that, is the notion that the god in whom I believe as a Christian is a god of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. You know that kind of a God? Like the ancient Greek God of lightning, who would be abolished in the first lecture in atmospheric physics at this university. <laughs> you see. And so the idea is that God is simply a placeholder, an X, who's holding place for certain things we don't understand until science comes and fills the gap. And so as science advances, We've much less space for God. Do you understand the logic of that? But now here's an important little bit of logic added to it. If that's what you think of God, you've got to choose between God and science. Because of the way you define God. Shall I repeat that? If you define God to be an unknown quantity who disappears in the advance of science, then of course you've got to choose between science and God, because that's the way you define God. But it is interesting, I'm sure you know, that the Bible does not start in the beginning. God created the bits of the universe that we don't understand. <laughs> you see, we're so familiar with these things that we don't realize how philosophically profound they are. The statement with which the Bible opens, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, is talking about ultimate causality of the existence and inauguration of the heavens and the earth, space, time, and everything else. It's the whole show. And that puts a totally different complexion on it. And explains now, next step, one of the other differences between Newton and Stephen Hawking. The interesting thing that I've discovered in reading both of these men, and you will understand it immediately I mention it, is that Isaac Newton used the law of gravity as evidence for the existence of God. Stephen Hawking uses the very same law to deny the existence of God. That fascinates me. <laughs> I hope it fascinates you. <laughs> now, taking Newton first, how did he look at things? He was a complex man, of course, as we all are. But uh, analyzing it, you see that when he discovered his law of gravity and other things, he wrote this brilliant book, The Principia Mathematica, and he expressed the hope that it would persuade a thinking person to believe in a deity. In other words, he was saying, look at this law of gravity, look at these laws of optics. Isn't God a genius doing it this way? The more he understood of the way it worked, the more he admired the genius of the God that had done it that way. 
Not the less. And of course, that's the way your mind works, isn't it? Let's take a typical German car, the Rolls Royce. Um, <laughs> gosh, you are awake. This is very impressive. Um, let's take a typical German car, the Rolls Royce. Well, the more you understand of automobile engineering, the more you can admire the genius of Rolls and Royce, not the less. The more you know of painting, the more you can admire the genius of a Rembrandt, not the less. The more you understand of the universe, the more you can admire the genius of the God who did it that way, not the less. Because, ah, because you see, God is not competing with science as an explanation. Now we'll get to that in a moment. But it's very interesting to see that at this level, Newton had his weaknesses, of course, philosophically, as we all do, but at this level, he wasn't a god of the gaps then. But he didn't make a fundamental, elementary philosophical mistake that you usually learn about in the first lecture. Explanation fascinates me, ladies and gentlemen. I've always been interested in it. Two big things, explanation and language. I wanted to be a linguist, I am a linguist, but I wanted to be a Latinist and uh, study Greek with a child, then I moved to modern languages, then I moved to electrical engineering, and then I moved to mathematics because it was the only way to get into Cambridge. So, <laughs> I have concentrated on the most extremely pure kind of language, that's mathematics, but there's a whole spectrum between mathematics and natural languages, computer languages, all these kinds of things. And language as it's used to explain. So let's start at this level with something elementary that I was not taught at school and I wish I had been. I was an adult before I learned this. Science explains. What does that mean? Take the law of gravity, since we're talking about Newton and Hawking. We might as well stick with gravity. It keeps our feet in the ground anyway. Um, <laughs> The law of gravity, what does it explain? Well, what does it not explain? Gravity. I wasn't taught that at school. Nobody knows what gravity is, not even today. If you don't believe me, read Richard Feynman, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics. And it was Wittgenstein, the philosopher, who made the point a long time ago and made it brilliantly. He said, the chief deception of modernism is the idea that the laws of nature are explanations of the phenomena of nature. They are not. They are descriptions. They've got predictive power. They're brilliant. Uh, Newton's laws can land a man on the moon without any Einsteinian corrections. But they don't tell us what gravity is. So even at the level of scientific explanation, they are limited, and we need to learn that, because the moment some intellectual guru says, science has explained this, well, we think there's an explanation at all conceivable levels, and of course there isn't. There never is. So that's the first point. Now, I'm very enthusiastic about science, but I stand very much influenced by Sir Peter Medawar, who wrote a brilliant book that every scientist ought to read on the limits of science, saying it does science no service to think that it can answer every question. And we may come to that in a moment or two. But the next point is that explanations come at different levels. Why is the water boiling? Well, because the heat energy from the gas flame is being conducted through the copper base of the kettle. We're still in Ireland, you see. Through the copper base of the kettle, and that is getting to the molecules of water, and they're getting agitated and upset, and they're moving faster and faster, and steam is beginning to rise, that's why it's boiling. No, it isn't. It's boiling because I'm desperate for a cup of tea. <laughs> well, I'm glad you laugh, ladies and gentlemen. It means you see the difference between two kinds of explanation. The first is scientific, the second is personal agency and intentionality, a teleological explanation. Now, I made you laugh because I said, no, it isn't. It's boiling because I want a cup of tea. And you saw that the anomalous words are, no, it isn't, as if the two kind of explanations are in conflict with one another. They're not, of course. They're complementary. 
There are different kinds of explanation. Now, I go into some schools, I find 10-year-olds can grasp that very well. I know a lot of professors that can't grasp it. Because they feel that the scientific explanation is the only one admissible. That's a very odd state of affairs, isn't it? And let me put it this way so that we can remember it. God no more competes with science as an explanation for the universe than Henry Ford competes with the law of internal combustion as an explanation for the motor car. It's obvious, isn't it? And yet again and again we're told, because science has discovered this law or this mechanism, therefore there's no agent who designed it. But that's a non sequitur. It simply doesn't logically follow. And that's another of the differences between Hawking and um, uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So the subject gets more and more interesting as we proceed into it. Of course, there's a great deal more to be said. What I'm suggesting to you is history points in the direction of a close connection between faith in the God of the Bible and the rise of modern science. Secondly, I'm suggesting that once we begin to investigate the nature of explanation, we realize that we're all very familiar with different levels of explanation. And when you extrapolate them up to the universe, they make perfect sense. Now, of course, I suppose I ought to deal with the question that is raised all the time, and Dawkins makes it a key point, so I'd better mention it in case you don't. Um, if you believe that God created the universe, you must logically ask who created God. Have you heard that argument? And then you must ask who created the God that created the God that created the God. Ad absurdum, so it's all nonsense, so let's go back to playing ice hockey or something. <laughs> you know that kind of argument, that it's absurd. Well, how about a bit of logic, ladies and gentlemen? Who created God, or what created God? Let's extrapolate one level up. Who or what created X? Analyze the statement, the question. What does the question assume? It, of course, assumes that God was created. Who created X assumes X is created. It's what some philosophers call a complex question because it's got a quasi-hidden assumption that changes the whole parameter of its explanatory power because, you see, the question doesn't apply to an eternal God by definition. It only applies to created gods. End of story. And Dawkins uses it to my utter amazement. I used to get this question a lot in Russia, but not in Oxford. But there it is, at the heart of his book, as if this is the knockdown argument, when it doesn't even face the question. The Bible claims in the beginning was the Word, and that's an existence statement. The Word already was, that is, the Word is eternal. God is eternal. So the question doesn't apply, but it does apply to created gods, doesn't it? So when, if you want to watch, and by the way, I always forget to do this, I've got a fairly substantial website with lots of stuff on it. You can see my debates with all sorts of people like Dawkins, johnlennox.org. When I put this to Richard Dawkins, I said, you think this is a valid question? Okay, let me try it on you. You believe that the universe created you. So who created your creator then? I've waited eight years for an answer to that question. <laughs> You see, really, philosophically, of course, what we're talking about is do the questions on either side go backwards infinitely or do they stop? And I find with most people, my atheist friends, of whom I have many, by the way, and myself, we both agree that the questions stop with an ultimate reality behind which you don't go. And for many of them, the ultimate reality is mass energy, or the multiverse, or the universe, or nowadays, the thing that's most in vogue is nothing but I'll talk about nothing in a moment. Um, <laughs> on my side of the story, the questions stop with God. He is the ultimate reality. 
You've got to start somewhere. So this whole thing is simply creates an intellectual fog. It doesn't actually penetrate the real issue. The question is not, is there an ultimate reality? The question is, which reality is ultimate? Now, what I want to come to is another simple but very important thing. And again, it might surprise you, but it is the nature of faith. The nature of faith. I'm often asked to give lectures on science and faith. I refuse to do them. Because we have a little conversation that goes like this. I say, do you want me to mention God? They said, of course. Well, I said, I don't see God anywhere in the title. Oh, but there's faith. Oh, really? I can give you a lecture on science and faith without mentioning God at all. Because faith is essential to science. And they haven't quite realized that. You see, the title Science and Faith is an atheist formulation. It's putting science on the one side and faith, and faith is ambiguous. It can either be a shorthand for religion, faith in God, and if you want to have that, please add the words in God, and then we'll know what you're talking about. But worse still, faith has been redefined. You may have noticed that. Faith means, for many of my colleagues, A, a religious term, B, it means believing where there's no evidence. And so they call me a man of faith, which is the greatest insult that they can conceive. <laughs> Lennox is a man of faith. Isn't that marvelous? He believes where there's no evidence, so there's no point in talking to him. Now, we need to scotch that, ladies and gentlemen, because that is blind faith, and it's a willful and deliberate twisting of it. And it's sometimes hilarious. Shall I tell you a story? <laughs> In a public lecture like this, sometimes you can get things across by story. And I'm an Irishman, St. Patrick's Day, so I'll tell you a story. <laughs> um, I had a debate with the world's leading bioethicist, Peter Singer from Princeton, in Australia. And um, I explained, as I usually do to audiences, where I was coming from, Ireland, I mean, and my parents, who were Christian without being sectarian, and they allowed me to think and so on. And so he got up and he said, well, there you are. You see, my biggest objection to this whole stuff is that you remain in the faith in which you grow up. So I thought this is going to be extremely interesting. So um, when I got my time to speak, I said, Peter, I told the audience about my background, so I'd I think they'd like to know about yours. Were your parents atheists? Yes, he said. Oh, I said. So, <laughs> so you remained in the faith in which you were brought up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, Peter, I'm sorry. I was under the impression you believed it. <laughs> Cyberspace went electric. <laughs> now, seriously, this is a world-famous philosopher who doesn't accept that his atheism involves a belief system. That's where we've got to. You Christians, you've got a belief system. You're people of faith, so you're not worth talking about. We don't have faith. Christopher Hitchens tried to cope with this by saying, our beliefs are not a belief, our faith is not a faith. And Dawkins writes, atheists don't have faith, and then writes a 400-page book about what he believes. <laughs> This is tragic, ladies and gentlemen. This is tragic, in my opinion. What they have redefined faith as is what we normally call blind faith. And that, of course, is dangerous. And I want to draw a marker here, because it's very important for me as a Christian, giving these lectures on Christianity in the university, to point out that faith in Christianity is exactly the same at one level as faith in science. It's evidence-based. And you can see that from all over the Bible, but in particular at the end of John's Gospel, which is a book of signs, indicators of Jesus' claim to deity and evidence for them. He says many other things that Jesus, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Here's the evidence on which faith is based. Now you see, 
the subtlety of the redefinition of faith is disastrous because it's focused attention away from the fact that faith is fundamental to science. Einstein once wrote, I cannot imagine a scientist without that faith. What faith? Not in God, but in the rational intelligibility of the universe. I was taught physics at Cambridge by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, and he never tires in his books of reminding us that, I quote, physics is powerless to explain its faith in the rational or mathematical intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you have to believe that before you can do any physics. So to say faith is irrelevant to science is nonsense. And people in Britain, I don't know whether they talk about it here, but they talk about faith schools. And they want to abolish faith schools. And I say, are you going to abolish all schools? Because every school is a faith school. Some of them are pumping secularism. Some of them are professing a particular religion. But they're all faith schools. You cannot get away from it. All of us have a worldview that influences our thinking. And these are deep worldview questions. But now, the interest starts. And again, I'm going to do it in a conversational style because it would take too long to do it uh, simply in philosophical terms. But you'll get the idea very simply. I love asking my, my colleagues what they do science with because they usually say, well, I got this machine that cost $10 billion and it's wonderful and it, all this. I said, I don't mean that. I mean this. Oh, they say, you mean my, and they almost say mind. And then they remember that there's no such thing as the mind, so they say brain. <laughs> well, I happen to believe there is such a thing as the mind, but we leave that aside. I'm very generous and I say, okay, tell me about the brain with which you do science. What's, what's, what really is the essence of it, its origin? Well, the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. <laughs> and I just look at them and smile and say, and you trust it. <laughs> do you know who first thought of that argument? Charles Darwin. Let me quote him to you. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man-mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. After all, what would one make of the convictions of the monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? That argument is now moving into the centre of this whole debate. And it's been moved into the centre of this whole debate by two world-class philosophers, one a Christian, one an atheist. The Christian is Alvin Plantinga. The atheist is Thomas Nagel. Alvin Plantinga says this, if Dawkins is right that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. His biology and his belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. Thomas Nagel is a strong atheist. He doesn't want there to be a God. And he has written a book with a very provocative title, Mind and Cosmos, Why the Neo-Darwinian View of the Nature is Almost Certainly False. And it has caused enormous discussion, as you might imagine. And his argument is the same argument. If the mental is not merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. I want to be very provocative in the hope of getting a few questions, which you've all thought about already, I hope. Do God and science mix? Of course. Do atheism and science mix? No. Because this argument shows you that what atheism does, taken to its logical conclusion, is to take the carpet from under the grounds for trusting in rationality to do science or any thinking at all. It doesn't only shoot itself in the foot, that could be quite painful. 
It shoots itself at the brain, which is fatal. Now, what we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, is dealing with reductionism. The idea, and it's again about explanation. We're told the idea that explanation is always bottom-up, from the simple to the complex and so on. And that is often the case, and it's been a very powerful method, particularly methodological reductionism, which investigates a big complex structure, splits it into little structures, studies the bits, and hopes to get insight on the whole thing. But what we're talking about here is ontological reductionism, ontos being that everything is reduced to physics and chemistry. And I've had this experience several times, sitting in Oxford at dinner with a biochemist, world famous, and he was very upset when he learned, A, that I was a pure mathematician because he told me that was boring. And secondly, when I tried to account for my presence by being interested in big questions of life, he shuddered and said, well, it's far worse than I thought then. <laughs> I'm a reductionist, I'm an atheist, and we're going to have a miserable evening, which, of course, is a challenge. And uh, I said, I don't think we are, because I'm actually very interested in reductionism. What kind are you? I know at least three kinds. So we started to discuss methodological reductionism, and he said, I don't mean that. I said, I know you don't. I mean, everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. That's the basis of my science. I said, really? Let's do an experiment, I said. He said, what, at the dinner table? I said, of course, this is Oxford. <laughs> so I picked up the menu. Forgive me if you've heard this story before, but it's one that's very useful, I find, in getting this across. It said, roast chicken, R-O-A-S-T. So he said, what's special about that? It's roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, it says it. How do you know? I said, these are, all I see is marks and paper. But he says, it's roast chicken, it's got meaning. Oh, I said, how's it? <laughs> okay, I said, here's the challenge. You're a reductionist, yes. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry, yes. Okay, explain to me the semiotics of those letters, the way they carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. <laughs> and his wife was there, a delightful lady, and she <laughs> said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> But he didn't try. He said, for 40 years, I've gone into my laboratory thinking that could be done. But he said, it so obviously can't. You need intelligence, an intelligence of the gaps, I suggested. Oh, no, no. He said, the explanatory power of physics and chemistry doesn't reach to semiotics. I said, exactly. You see, the one sphere where we never reason from the simple to the complex is where language is concerned. The moment you see language, you infer upwards to intelligence, however complex natural, mechanical processes may be in producing the language. And now the fun starts. R-O-A-S-T, that's only five letters. But he studied DNA. 3.5 billion letters in the right order, the chemical alphabet. So I gently asked him, what about that? Oh, well, that's chance and the laws of nature. Really, I said? You see five letters on a menu, and you immediately say intelligence, and you see the longest word we've ever discovered, and you say chance and the laws of nature. What on earth is going on? <laughs> you may well ask, ladies and gentlemen. And now I conclude on a very simple point. We've looked at two worldviews. One is the bottom-up, the other is both bottom-up and top-down. The bottom-up one, the materialistic one, starts with the particles or mass energy or nothing. I haven't had time to talk about nothing, so maybe you want to ask me about that. <laughs> because the big question these days is how do you get a universe from nothing? So I leave that in the air. But it starts bottom-up, either from nothing or particles or mass energy or something. And produces everything, life, consciousness, and the idea of God, because there isn't a God. The other worldview, which I hold, starts like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him. That is an existence statement. And without Him, nothing came to be that came to be. So you either start with nothing, mass energy or whatever, 
and you climb up unaided by any input of intelligence from outside because this universe is a closed system of cause and effect, or you turn the whole thing upside down and you say this universe was created by a series of speech acts and God said from an intelligent God, and it bears the hallmarks of his informational input in a staggering way, and we've lived to see it, the longest word we've ever discovered on which all of our lives depend. What a fascinating way, time to live, the information age, and now we come to the supreme irony. Crick and Watson are open or were open about the fact that it was their atheism that drove them to try to unravel the secret of life and dismiss God. They've given us the biggest evidence at that level for God's fingerprints. And here's the irony of it. They were materialists. But you see, information, and that could lead us into a huge study, but I've written about it, and if you're interested, you can look at it. Information, ladies and gentlemen, is carried on material carriers. It's not itself material. And the irony of our age is the 21st century, physicists coming increasingly to the conclusion that information is not reducible to physics and chemistry for the simple reason it's not material. Well, that's the end of materialism, actually. From within science, without doing any philosophy whatsoever. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.